This will be interspliced, I think. Um, at, I, Jean-Jacques Chalifou was the um, president of Casca uh, before me. And uh, then I became president and uh, Marie-France Labrec uh, was the president after me. And uh, when I became um, president, I'd been working with Marie-France uh, quite a bit, and um, also uh, Bernard, Bernier, and Pierre uh, Bocage, and so on. So I felt uh, very strongly that the uh, president of Casca should be uh, absolutely bilingual and should really do um, their work in both languages. But I didn't feel very strong, very confident of my French, and... Uh, I mean, I, I grew up in Geneva. I mean, I, I, I learned French when I was quite young. Um, but I felt, you know, that my conversational French has not been so great. And uh, I must say, even though I'd lived in Montreal for so long, I mean, I lived in Montreal for must be 12 years or something, I should think, off and on. But, I, you know, I, I, don't, I don't think my French had really developed very well. So I did a Berlitz course. I even got the University of Toronto to fork out quite a lot of money to do an intensive Berlitz course. Um, and, uh, and I was still quite nervous about my you know, bilingual speech. And Jean-Jacques was fantastic, you know, because he said to me, when you speak another language, you don't, you don't care about the fine things about whether the grammar's right or whether you use the right word. You just do it, you know? And that was such great advice and absolutely is, is Jean-Jacques character, you know? That's what he said. You just do it, you know? And that was um, really quite helpful. And uh, although I do remember that um, uh, I gave a talk um, in, um, I think it was in St. John's, when I was around the time when I was the president. And I tried to give, you know, quite a bit of the talk in French and, and in English. The other person who was giving the talk um, was um, uh, the guy whose brother is the filmmaker. Bernard Arcon? Bernard Arcon. And so Bernard was also giving a talk. And Bernard was so superior to me, he managed to give the talk in alternate paragraphs, the first paragraph in French and the second paragraph in English, all the way through his talk. I mean, that's really pretty, pretty impressive. Um, anyway, so that's just on the side and that can be spliced in. But um, so, so, yeah, so I came back from um, Peru, uh, find, found myself without a supervisor, um, got Hobsbawm on side, but I still um, was not really very sure um, about whether I should stay at Sussex, given the fact that there really was nobody there who knew about my work or anything. So I went on a little bit of a trip. I went to Manchester uh, to see if I could go to the university, get, do my PhD at Manchester. And... Um, at Manchester at that time, Peter Worsley was, uh, was there, um, and um, Mitchell. Um, so I was sitting in the corridor waiting to see the graduate coordinator about going to Manchester when this, this professor comes down the hallway with sort of, um, sort of plaid trousers on and a black shirt and a red tie um, and he goes into his office, and then he comes out and he says, well, what are you doing sitting at this bench? And I say, well, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm going to go and see the graduate coordinator about coming to Manchester. And he said, where are you from? And I said, well, I'm from Canada. 
oh, he said, come into my office. I want to talk to you, you know. And then he said, Worsley, who, of course, at that point was, um, you know, was a Maoist and, and was extremely pro-China. Why do you want to leave Montreal? He said, Does, why would any crazy guy want to leave Montreal and come to England? The only radical place to be now is Quebec. You know, you've got to get back there. What are you wasting your time coming to Montreal, to Manchester? Uh, so we had, you know, a bit of a conversation. He uh, strongly discouraged me from going to Manchester at that point. He was about to leave, in fact. Um, and But I, d I don't think that would have made much difference. I mean, I, I, I thought about uh, going to Manchester. And just for the, for the record, um, I would say that at that point, we're now talking about the mid-70s or the early 70s. Um, the... The really big schools of anthropology in the United Kingdom were London School of Economics, Oxford, Cambridge, Edinburgh, and, and Manchester. And of those, Manchester in many ways was certainly probably the, one of the major department. It, it had been Gluckman's department there's a whole Manchester School of Anthropology, um, which was very important and very influential. And, and quite influential for me in my early days because Bailey had been very influenced by um, the Manchester School. Um, so anyway, yeah, so I tried going to Manchester wasn't too sure about that. Um, went down to Cambridge um, and um, thought that maybe I would go there. Now, of course, I didn't really know a lot of people, but I did know that Edmund Leach was at Cambridge. Um, so I wrote to him and asked him if I could come and see him. And uh, Leach, of course, was somebody who, generally speaking, people were pretty terrified of. Um, in my department in Toronto, subsequently, when I f came to Toronto, um, Bill Dunning was, uh, was in the department at that point. He was a senior professor, and he had been a student of uh, Edmund Leach. And Leach treated him like absolute dirt whenever he had anything to do with him. So I was pretty terrified anyway about... I, of course, didn't know that at this point, but I did know that Leach had a bit of a reputation. And he, he, was, um, he was provost of King's College at that point, King's College, Cambridge, which was quite unusual because he was an outspoken humanist. And uh, King's College has the most uh, famous chapel of the colleges of Oxford and Cambridge and uh, is notorious. He was the first provost that had ever been uh, not a member of the Anglican Church. Um, anyway, I, I, met, I met Leach. He was extremely nice, very helpful, not at all interested in peasant rebels, the last thing that he was interested in. Um, and uh, my father had been at Cambridge, so he was quite excited about the idea that I might go to Cambridge. And uh, I was quite excited about the fact that I was going to meet the provost. Um, and that he was. And then he said, well, maybe we should go for lunch. So I thought I was going to be going to the high table, sitting with the provost at the at King's College. And that was just another one of Edmund Leach's jokes. We, we walked along. So, uh, yeah, so I, I, we walk out of his office and we walk through the quad. And suddenly he turns right and goes down some steps and we find ourselves facing a sandwich machine. And he asks me if I have some change and I buy him a sandwich and we drink, you know, have <laughs> a sandwich and a, and a cold cold drink. So that was my opportunity to have lunch at the high table with uh, Edmund Leach. Anyway, he, he, um, he pushed me towards seeing Jack Goody, who was also at, at Cambridge. Um, and eventually, um, I went into um, a new department that had been founded, which was uh, called something like Social Studies or Social Political Studies. And it was headed by um, Barnes. Um, now, um, 
let's see now, uh, J.A. Barnes was his name. He was the person who really started network theory in anthropology, the father of network theory. Uh, he had been in, he's, he was English, but he'd been teaching in New Zealand, and he came back to start to be the head of this new department. And there's a little kind of uh, quaint academic story here, because um, up until that point, Cambridge didn't have a sociology department. There was an anthropology department, which was very respectable, in fact, so respectable that the the Prince of Wales even went and did his degree in anthropology. Um, but the idea that, the, uh, that Cambridge should have a sociology department, which was extremely sort of, uh, I don't know, slightly not, not quite sort of elite enough for Cambridge, was very worrying to many people. So they decided for the first time, I think, ever to actually give, in theory, uh, or anybody who has an MA from Oxford or Cambridge is allowed to vote in, uh, if, if they put it to a vote to the MA. So they, they actually had a, a kind of a referendum to see if uh, they should uh, found a sociology department at Cambridge. And um, it was voted down. So they were unable to have a sociology department. So they, they, they opened something called a social studies, I think it was called, or social and political studies. And just to make sure that they didn't offend anybody, they made an anthropologist the head of it, which was, which was Barnes. So he, was, um, he agreed to, I asked him if I could um, work with him, and uh, he agreed. So I, was tra I transferred from Sussex to uh, Cambridge. Um, and uh, was in this new department. One of the things I'd said to Barnes when, I, when I, he agreed to be my supervisor was, I said, look, let's be clear about this. Um, I've, I'm already um, pretty much um, ready to, you know, kind of finish my thesis and so on and so forth. I don't want to be tied down with um, any kind of residence requirements or anything like this. So... Um, he agreed, no, no, there was no problem there. Uh, after I'd been at Cambridge for about four or five months, I was called into some interview committee, and they told me that I would have to be resident at Cambridge for two years before I could get my PhD. And this was just some sort of, you know, antiquated law. And I remember, um, I mean, this is the classic sort of English stuff, you know, it shows uh, what it's like being in academia in England, is certainly in those days. Um, because uh, there seemed to be no way I could get around this. I would have to stay at Cambridge for at least two years if, if they were going to grant me a degree. There was, however, one exception, and I was asked if I had ever been in the Queen's Household Cavalry. <laughs> and I said, no, I hadn't, because that was the only way in which you, were, you, were <laughs> you could actually not be um, part of the residence. So as a result of that, I quit Cambridge and went back to Sussex. Uh, and, and sort of uh, did this kind of peripatetic thing. So that was kind of my grad. That was the sort of story of my um, my graduate education. Um, I finished at um, Sussex in seventy five. Um, I uh, I got a telegram, I think, from um, the University of Toronto saying that they'd heard that I was finishing my degree. For people who are looking for jobs now in, in, uh, in the, the academy, this is a pretty horrific story, I can tell you, because um, it was so amazingly easy. Um, I got a telegram saying that they heard that I was interested in uh, a job, and there was a job available at Toronto, and um, would I be interested? I was no—I don't think I was ever interviewed. I don't think I even had a phone interview that I can remember. I sent in some papers and my CV, and um, and then they they offered. It was only an eight-month job. They offered me an eight-month job, um, and I thought that the term began in October in Canada, so I said that I'd turn up in October. Of course, the term had already begun by the time I got here. Um, 
but you know it is kind of amazing to think that you, you kind of got a job in that in that kind of way then and the other thing too which is is a kind of a funny story considering the the the, the kind of atmosphere we live in today after i'd been in england for about um i don't know about eight months after i left canada i realized that i really wanted to be a canadian citizen um but by this point, I'd lived in Canada since I was 17, and this was like, so I'd gone to Canada in 60, and we're now talking, it was now about 72 or something, it's sort of 12 years later. So I went into the Canada house in Trafalgar Square, and I said, well, I want to be a Canadian citizen. And uh, they said, well, how, you know, if you lived in Canada, oh, yeah, I've lived in Canada for a long time, and stuff like that. And um, so the guy said, fine, and he when he put his hand down and he pulled out a Bible and he put it on the top and he put my hand on the Bible and he said, okay, say after me. And I, he read out this little thing and I reeled the thing out. And then he said, right, sign this piece of paper. He said, right, now you're a landed immigrant. <laughs> that was it. I never had no, I didn't fill out any papers. I didn't do anything. Now, of course, I was white and I was English and stuff like this, so of course, and, I, and so on. I'm sure it wouldn't have been the same for everybody, but even so, it does show how things have changed a little bit. Um, so anyway, uh, 75, um, I came back uh, to Canada, um, to Toronto, um, and uh, what, basically it was sort of interesting because um, I think I had been hired um, on the understanding that I was a student of... F.G. Bailey and that I did this kind of micro politics kind of stuff that Bailey did which was also very much what the Manchester school really did in a way um, and I think that was their interest in having me in the department um, so they were a bit surprised when they found that what they'd actually got was an Althusserian Marxist um, and I think that was uh, a source of a certain amount of uh, discomfort perhaps in the department when I first came this was now 75 we're still you know in the radical days are still around um and very much so for the next couple of years um but my contract was only an eight-month contract so what would happen would be at the end of April or May uh my contract would be up and I would go back to um to England um and uh, I'm just trying to think. Yeah, I guess what I should do at this point is say a little bit about the kind of anthropology that I was kind of doing. Um, so, I mean, if you think about it, 1969, um, I, I came into anthropology. I did my first makeup year in 1970 uh, at McGill, just doing dribs and drabs of courses. 1969 was the year that Eric Wolf wrote Peasant Wars of the 20th Century. Um, and increasingly, even though I had gone to study a particular kind of anthropology with Bailey, by the time I came back from my field work, and also because of being supervised by Hobsbawm, I became... Um, much more interested in a, a kind of uh, what we tend to call now political economy uh, kind of anthropology. So the, the key figures for me were people like Eric Wolf and Sidney Mintz. Uh, and um, in England, there were very few uh, people who were openly Marxist anthropologists. At that point, um, Maurice Bloch was, uh, was very interested in Marxist anthropology. Frankenberg had always been uh, uh, taken a kind of Marxist view in anthropology. And Max Gluckman, although he never was actually a member of the party, his wife, I believe, was a member of the South African or uh, Communist Party, um, or certainly at some point. Um, but England wasn't really uh, a place where um, you did that kind of anthropology in a way, not at that point. Um, I became involved with a small group of people 
who were quite interested in um, what really what you would call the sort of French Marxist anthropology, Meyassou, uh, Terre, um, Ronc- uh, well, uh, in those days, even Roncier. Um, and, um, and we founded, the, 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 a group of people founded a journal called Critique of Anthropology. Uh, these were people like Olivia Harris, um, Jonathan Friedman, John Gledhill, uh, and so on. And it was founded as a kind of um, collective. Uh, and um, so that was, that was one of the things that sort of happened while I was uh, in my graduate school years. So, so by the time I was beginning to get established at the University of Toronto, I was really um, very interested in... Um, the, the, the sort of overlap between French Marxist anthropology, people like Goudelier, uh, who was, who I'd been in touch with and 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 knew a little bit, and people like Eric Wolf and so on, and um, so during those first years, as I say, I would I would sort of move backwards and forwards, um, and uh, I went to a workshop. Um, that was organized by William Roseberry, um, in which uh, Eric, Eric Wolf was one of the main people. And um, at that point, I was trying to get my first book published, which was called Livelihood and Resistance. Um, and it was about the, the situation in Peru. Um, and it had been, I'd had a kind of bad situation with uh, Princeton because they they had a Latin America series and they closed the Latin America series m- midway through me doing a revision of my manuscript and Wolf um, read the manuscript and um, he was published by California and so he he got he sort of pushed my book to toward California and that's kind of how it got published there um, and again I mean I think that's again a sign of the times you know it was. Um, because of Wolf's sponsorship, in a way, I, I, I don't feel that I, I went through the hoops as perhaps I, sh- I should have done. I was very fortunate that he was very much a person who was interested in my work. Um, so that was some, um, I was doing that for, I think, at least three years I did that, that sort of eight month contract thing with Toronto. And at that point, I sort of felt that I'd done enough of being an academic. Um, and, uh, you know, I'd had my seven years, you have your sort of seven year cycle, seven years in banking, seven years in anthropology, time to move on. Um, so I, I, I thought I would, um, I would uh, maybe go to Spain and uh, get a job there as a taxi driver or something like that. Um, and uh, because I, because it was, it, it was sort of there was a sort of natural part of the se- sequence, you know. I, I, I'd have my eight months, I'd go back to England. Why not just go to Spain instead of go to England? And why not get some sort of a job there and not worry about coming back all the time to this academic community? And uh, so that was my plan. Um, I at that point was uh, I, I had. Uh, um, a partner and a kid, uh, my, my daughter, um, my, my, my oldest daughter was, uh, I guess about three years old then. And, uh, Harriet Friedman, who was in the sociology department here at the University of Toronto said to me, well, you know, why don't you just put it, put your, uh, why don't you just, um, apply for a grant. At least if you applied for a grant, you wouldn't have to drive a taxi and, and you could sort of, you know, check out what it's like in Spain. So I applied for a grant, a shirt grant, to do my research in Spain. And uh, I must say, I didn't really know a hell of a lot about Spain. <laughs> but, uh, you know, I read quite a bit, I guess, and so on. I applied for the grant and I got it. Um, so I went to Spain um, and... Uh, did a year's field work, um, and that was in 1978, 1979. 
And but in fact, uh, I really didn't have any intention of going on at the University of Toronto. I thought that, um, I, as I say, I was on a kind of contract basis, and I thought that this would be a chance to um, make a move of some kind. Maybe go back into the academy, but maybe not. Maybe do something else. Um, but uh, I did sort of have, at that point, you know, a number of students in the department who were, you know, who I'd got to know and who, who were sort of, you know, we were part of a kind of a uh, bit of a group, I guess. Um, and I think the word got out that I was thinking that I wouldn't come back. Um, and uh, so I was, um, again, I don't know, I can't remember what the form of communication was in those days, but I, I was approached by the department and offered a, a tenure line job while I was in Spain as a, as a way of kind of getting me back uh, into the department. So, and that's, that's kind of how, how that worked. So I'd kind of made a switch um, from Latin America, uh, but I should make clear that it wasn't um, an either or situation. Um, I did, I did long-term field work in Spain from 78 through to uh, the sort of September 79. But I was still going back. I went back to Peru in 81 and again in 84. Uh, I think 84, 86, I think, was the last time I, I went back. Um, so I was kind of doing field work in both places. Um, yeah, so, so what I would do then, um, the, 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 the sort of pattern that would emerge <laughs> then would be that... Um, I decided to do this field work in Spain, and perhaps this is a good point, a good moment to explain why I I sort of thought about doing field work in Spain. Um, the thing that interested me, the thing that I think I'd learned about um, sort of political mobilization from the Peruvian from the Peruvian people I'd lived with, was that. It's not the case, as I had been told, that the separation of country and, and city would be a, a radical break in the formation of the working class. Um, that uh, what I could see happening in Peru was that urban working class people, or certainly urban shanty town dwellers and informal workers in the, in the informal economy, were quite closely tied to their rural, quotes, peasant uh, um, relations and, and so on. So the question I wanted to ask myself was, well, perhaps that's true too in, in a more uh, industrialized kind of context. Maybe, it's, maybe we've been too fixated on the idea that the industrial working class is urban and the people who live in the countryside are necessarily sort of agriculturally inclined. So what I was really looking for was I was looking for a region where there was uh, quite a lot of industrialization, but not urban industrialization. It was actually spread through the countryside. And so um, I looked uh, around the Mediterranean coast, and in Valencia, uh, there's a long history of um, what you could call sort of rural manufacturing. Um, and this, to some extent, is tied to the kinds of crops that were grown in that area. Valencia is famous for its irrigated ag agriculture. The original, the original uh, constructors of it being the Moors, the the the, the um, you know the during the Moorish occupation of of southern Spain. And what was what uh, what the agriculture was used for was for for uh, there was there'd been silk production which required uh, processing uh, from the from the silk uh, worm to the to the silk um, to the to the thread um, there'd been wine production which required turning the grapes into wine uh, and 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 uh, more recently there had been. Um, uh, sisal and um, esparto uh, production, uh, which which is for making rope, um, and in fact Valencia was supplied 
uh, all the sails for the Spanish Navy uh, at a time when the Spanish Navy was very, very large. Uh, so there was this, always this combination of agriculture and manufacturing uh, in Valencia. And the result was that there was actually a rural industrial working class and that's what I was particularly interested in, whether that meant that they, there was a kind of possibility for um, a kind of um, working class political movement in those kind of circumstances. And that was what sort of drove me to do the work in, in uh, Valencia. So I did a year of field work there, and then I would keep going back. It was such an easy way to do it. I mean, that's the great thing about the Canadian uh, university system that we have a significant amount of time during the summer uh, to um, do field work and so I would go back and do field work uh, in the summers um, and meanwhile uh, trying to write the book on um, on Peru so the book on Peru came out in 1989 um, so 10 years after I had started my field work in Spain, the book on, on Peru came out. Um, quite a long time, I think, quite a long gap between uh, when I finished my Peruvian field work and when I actually did the, the, um, got the book out. Um, I was very, um, I, I felt, especially doing field work in the Mediterranean um, and it, yeah, in Mediterranean Europe. But I think more generally, I, I felt that there was a, a really major ethical issue um, that was not being addressed by anthropologists. Uh, and that was that they were very prone to sort of parachute into... Um, a particular area, whether it was Indonesia or New Guinea or, or uh, Peru, um, do their field work, often relying on local scholars to give them a lot of the local background that they needed, whether it was history or geography or whatever, go back to their central northern European or North American university write up their thesis, and, and there it was. Um, and I felt this was really quite problematic. Um, I think there's a very interesting contradiction that anthropologists who work outside their own country face, and that is that um, when you get deeply involved in your fieldwork somewhere else, you become very deeply involved with uh, local scholars and, and political activists and so on. And they become a real source of support for your field work and they help you in so many different ways, not just in, in knowledge ways, but in network ways, in supporting you and giving you kind of emotional support and so on and so forth. And the reason that they are so crucial to you is because they have such a strong commitment to their local area. They know the things that you don't know. They're actually committed to the local history, to the local geography, to the local political mo movements and so on. And what are you? You, by definition, have come from somewhere else and are, are studying outside your own backyard. And... Um, I think this is this is actually quite a uh, an ethical issue. Um, there's a lovely scene in in a movie uh, by um, a, a movie called um, Mexico Insurgente, uh, Insurgent Mexico, which is uh, a movie about Reed, who um, who um, John Reed, who who. Uh, wrote uh, 10 Days That Shook the World, which was about the Russian Revolution. But he also wrote a book before that, which was called Insurgent Mexico, um, which was about the Mexican Revolution. John Reed was from New, New, New Jersey, and he was a member of the Wobblies, the, uh, the world uh, revolutionaries, if you like. And uh, 
there's a lovely scene in that movie where um, he's really become involved with the uh, this tro- the, the troops of Villa's uh, army, uh, the, the peasants who are fighting in the army, and they're drinking together. And uh, at one point they turn to Juan and they say, Juan, it's great that you're so interested in what we're doing down here, the fighting the, the authoritarian regime and, and so on. But what are you, uh, why aren't you back home in New Jersey? Aren't there some people around in New Jersey that are doing some pretty significant stuff? You know, this was back in the 19, sort of 14, 19 sort of period. And the Wobblies, of course, were a major um, uh, sort of political threat to the industrial corporate classes. Uh, And that was, that really hit me. I mean, that was very much the way I felt myself. So, um, I became very and very committed in my Spanish work uh, to um, to find somebody to do the field work, not do the field work with me, but actually help me in writing the book. Maybe write a comparative book using somebody else's field work, some Spanish person's field field work with my own field work. Um, and that was particularly important because of the way in which. Mediterranean, Anglophone Mediterranean anthropology was being written.